Uh, we're good. So, um, are you right, Ange? Yes, I am. Okay. Ready to roll. Excellent. Well, Peter, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. No, thanks a lot, guys. Really appreciate the opportunity. It's fantastic. So, um, you're not the first world champion we've had on the show, but you're certainly very unique. Um, do you want to just let our audience know uh, sort of your, your background and, and sort of how you've got to where you are today? Okay. Um, should I start with like before my accident or just... <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, do, do you come from a sporting background? Yes. So, I mean, I, I grew up, you know, doing a lot of sports. You know, I started off primary school. High school was more running, really, that... Um, you know, that I excelled in, um, made provincial teams in, in South Africa um, in athletics and cross-country and those type of things. Mm -hmm. um, and But, I mean, it was always a big thing for my parents, you know, that we should be balanced, so, I mean, on the culture side and the academics and those type of things. So I ended up studying actuarial science um, at a university in South Africa and um, qualified and did my honours in investment management. Um, and all along, I, I did... Um, you know, I started doing the multi-sport things, more at varsity, and then started doing triathlon. I raced as age group at World Champs in Edmonton in 2001. I mm. also uh, made the South African student teams uh, in cycling and triathlon. Um, and, yeah, you know, there's like a student's World Champs and those type of things as well out there. You know? so, but, yeah, so, I mean, it was always a big thing, sport for me. And then um, 6 October 2003, um, you know, most people thought all my dreams were shattered. I was out cycling and then uh, a, a lady just didn't see me um, in a car and knocked me over. Um, and I broke my neck. Uh, I broke my femur, my wrists, and my kneecap and all bunch of other stuff. But the most of it was my neck um, at C5-6 level. And um, that's how I ended up as a C6 quadriplegic. Mm. Well, and... Um was there a long recuperation period? Like, was it? I'm gathering it was, it's obviously a very serious accident. Oh yeah, no. I mean, look. So uh, you know, I, I, I was actually injured from C4. So you know, just to explain. That's the four, four vertebra from the top of your head. You know, so initially I couldn't move anything. Um, you know, while I was lying there on the tar, um, you know, I, I knew something was seriously wrong with my neck, whether it be permanent, I didn't know. Um, but I mean, at that stage, I could still breathe and I could still see and all those type of things. Um, mm. But yeah, then I got to the hospital and I started battling to breathe and they took x-rays and I had to go to another hospital because I couldn't deal with the severity of, of um, the accident. And um, yeah, then eventually I ended up on a ventilator for 32 days. I lost my sight for two weeks, all the control of my sight because the swelling went up into my brainstem. Um, and yeah, you know, so things went from bad to worse. First, you know, they, they thought I was on my way out, you know, and on top of that, you know, when you break your femur at that age, you know, it's very dangerous um, if you don't, you know, get it sorted out quick enough, you know, so there was a lot of complications and so on. So I ended up in ICU for 42 days mm. um, before I, in, you know, finally got got to go to rehab. So, yeah, you know, so I mean, um, ending up a C6 squad, just to explain to the audience as well, um, you know, what I do have is I've got um, wrist extension, like lifting up my wrists. I've got bicep movement and I've got shoulder movement. And that's pretty much it. You know, I can't move my fingers or my hands at all. I've got no tricep, um, functional tricep movement. And then I'm completely paralyzed from my nipples down. So, you know, it is a very severe injury to start off with, you know, so. Mm, yeah. And um, you, you mentioned that before your accident that you were really active in sports and you were doing triathlons as well. Were you also doing an Ironman prior to your accident? No, no. At that stage, I was only racing, you know, I still had the Olympic dream. Um, and I was only racing, um, like, Olympic distances. I had done one half Ironman. Um, at that stage, it wasn't a Ironman branded off Ironman in our country, but I had done one, but it was over distance training, you know, so... Uh, you know, I, I hadn't raced the long distance and seriously, you know, so, um, and I mean, I was on track, like my, my cycling and running was brilliant, but my swim, you know, needed some, you know, because in the drafting races, you have to swim well, you know, to be with the guys, you know, otherwise you're mm. just too far behind, so, um, but yeah, I mean, so I was working really hard on my swim in the off season when, uh, you know, my accident happened, so. But yeah, you know, so, um, and uh, I was actually, you know, the last year before my accident, I was training with a guy, um, Reynard Tissink. Um, he's actually now coaching me. Mm -hmm. So you might know the name. He, you know, he was a pro Ironman athlete. You know, he's been in the top 10 at Kona, I think, four or five times, you know, and yeah. he's won eight Ironman titles. So anyway, he's a, he was a good friend. And then after my accident, he actually 
planted the seed of paraplegics doing Ironmans um, you know, when I was still in rehab. And uh, yeah, I think from there, that became my biggest dream, you know. So I've been right. to, I, I come to London 2012, you know, but the only event open for my class was sprints, you know, so it's not my thing, but going to the games, you know, for me was obviously a big thing, you know, so, but, you know, all the way from when I broke my neck, like becoming the first quad to do Ironman was really a big dream, you know, and, um, you know, there's two quad classes in, in disability sport. Um, so you get the quads who's got triceps and limited hand function. Some of them, you know, they've, they've almost got full arms and then it's just the one hand that's weak and the other hand almost normal. Um, but the point is they've got strong triceps and then you get the guys without triceps in, in, in the weaker class now. I'm the quad in the weaker class. So, um, you know, to be the first quad to beat those, you know, beat those guys as well, you know, that, that was just incredible, you know. Um, there was another guy um, from America who attempted Ironman Florida quad, but he, he was in the class above me actually, um, and he unfortunately didn't make the swim cut off. But you know, luckily for me, that that gave me the opportunity to to be the first quad. You know, so um, absolutely. And I've got I've got a lot of questions <laughs> as uh, as totally. to your racing. <laughs> um, uh, uh, what the the most obvious question I think uh, one of the the, the part of the challenge of of the triathlon is the swim, and you've got no tricep um, ability. So how, yeah. how how do you go about completing the 3.8 kilometres? Okay, so um, you know I do a double on backstroke, uh, and I mean obviously doing these type of distances, I literally have about 15% of the muscle movement that the able body would have. Um, so you can't just go out in the first year, just go do it. You know you have to build it up slowly, obviously, otherwise your yeah. muscles won't make it. I think. So I do like a double arm backstroke. It's basically a butterfly stroke and the opposite way around. Um, you know, and my head's like under the water, but I've got my own like technique of breathing. And I, you're allowed obviously to wear wetsuit. Um, mm -hmm. But I always, you know, in any race I do, I have got a guy who swims with me. Safety issue because obviously I can't cough either. You know, so if I swallow water and those things, it's dangerous. Um, mm -hmm. And um, he just keeps me keeps helps me keep my line. You know, so I don't have to turn around and look up and keep my line, you know, so yeah. he literally right. swims behind me and taps my feet to make sure I keep my line, basically, so, mm. and that's how I do it, you know, so, and it's amazing for me, um, you know, this morning I was out training and a guy, like, read my story and he just did the half Ironman that was this past weekend, um, and like, you know, for me, the toughest part is to make the bike cut off, you know, because we have to make the able body cut off times, uh -huh. but, um, and, and on the bike is where I lose most of my time, but like, for him, it doesn't matter what I told him, he just still can't understand how I can swim. <laughs> And finish the swim and swim like hour and thirty eight on a three point eight k. You know, he, he mm. just doesn't understand it. You know, so so that, for, that's now like, an easier uh, cut off to make is the swim. You know, so right. So you're swimming a sub one forty swim. Yeah, and look, I don't know if you know, um, you know, everything about the story, but six weeks before my um, before I attempted the the Ironman, um, I was out cycling and another cyclist didn't see me and did a U turn and I broke my forearm in three pieces. So um, I did Ooh. that six mm. weeks after I broke my arm. You know, I put a plate in, and I, you know, my wife and I, you know, I'm quite a religious guy. We just felt, you know, we take a leap of faith, and we just knew it's still on the cards. You know, so and um, so it's really grace from above. But you know, point being, I think I can possibly do close to 130 if it wasn't for that. You know, wow. so. Um, but I mean, it, look, I train like a professional, you know, I train 40 hours a week at, on my tough weeks and stuff. So, I mean, it, I really put a lot in it, you know, so, so I mean, that's why you can swim up to those speeds. You know. Absolutely. It's, it, yeah, it's, it's no wonder you're called Super Pete. Man, <laughs> it's like, you know, okay, I've, I've, I've got a very basic question and um, you, 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 you mentioned that... Um, uh, you had to you had to retrain your muscles because you only have 15% of your muscle movement in your body. So after the accident and after you recuperated, when you had some strength, um, how did you even start um, the training program at all? You know, yeah, you know, as I say, for me it's really a lot of grace from above. But uh, you know, I just never stopped. You know, a lot of guys have to work through the whole psychological process and. I look, uh, most psychologists would say I'm still in denial, you know, because I like looked at the pills they gave me, and every time I threw out that antidepressant pill and everything. But like for me, I just carried on, you know. I I just believe your mindset, um, you know, it doesn't help looking backwards. You know, you have to look forward, and 
and yeah, you know, sometimes a door closes to open the door, if I can put it that way, you know, and um, so for me, I just see when bad things happen, I see it as an opportunity to be great, and I immediately, when I got back home, I actually started with wheelchair rugby first, um, you know, it's, it's like more like American football, um, but I mean, it was a sport, and it got you stronger. Um, <laughs> Going going back home, you know, I went back home, um, you know, in rehab, if you're a C6 squad with what you have, they'll just tell you you can't be independent. Um, mm. So, I mean, they can teach you only so much, but I mean, when I went back home, I wanted to get myself independent. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't know if you want to hear anything about that, but I mean, so obviously first the obstacles were to get dressed and all those type of things, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, for a year, you know, I spent a year getting myself independent, getting myself to be able to get in and out of the car and get my chair in and out of the car myself and drive myself and, you know, eventually get back, you know, off, I, I, the first two weeks when I got back home from rehab, I first finished my honours degree, um, obviously orally, but I studied those two weeks and then, you know, I was on my journey of um, getting myself independent. Um, and look, a very, very nice story. I always tell people it's my getting dressed story. But, you know, so when I got back home, I made sure that I can dress myself um, fully, you know, like put my socks on, my underpants, my pants and and the mm -hmm. shoes. But, you know, now you can imagine I have to figure out these techniques because everybody told you you can't do it with what you mm -hmm. have. So mm -hmm. if you can't move your fingers um, at all, there's no grip, nothing. So you have to figure out how you use this body of yours, you know. So, um and it took me 50 minutes, 5-0, to be fully dressed and I was dead tired, you know. Yeah. And then I just said, okay, I'm going to take every day and I'll give myself 15 minutes, 1-5. And dress up to 15 minutes and then once I get there, the person that's with me can help me get fully dressed. And right. every day I found myself getting dressed, you know. And I mean, initially the person who was with me laughed, you know, like, only Marks gets it going, she had to start my stopwatch, you know. Obviously that, <laughs> you know, but, you know, Every day I got a little bit closer, maybe sometimes three steps forward, one step backwards, but I think it took about a month and I was on 15 minutes and I was fully dressed, you know, and I thought, mm -hmm. you know, 15 minutes is a nice functional time. And then I said, okay, well, I'm going to make my world record impossible time for getting dressed seven minutes. I'll probably never get there, but <laughs> as I saw myself getting faster on a daily basis, that motivated me and I timed everything, you know, like eating, getting in and out of the bath, or everything, you know, but the, for me the watch was the motivator because as I got faster, it meant, I'm, it meant I got better, you know. And, um, you know, one day I opened my eyes, I was under 10 minutes, and I think it was two months later, I was under seven minutes, you know, so I thought seven minutes was going to be impossible, the world record. And I mean, when I say seven minutes, that's underpants, pants, socks, shoes, and I can get in the chair from the bed, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I get dressed on the bed with my shirt on, like probably under, under three, uh, under... I think, yeah, I think at that stage, seven and a half minutes or so. And um, I don't time myself every day anymore, but um, currently my record is two minutes and 41 seconds. So, you know, we are... It's faster than you and I. <laughs> you know, now it's three times faster. So, you know, it just goes to show you that we shouldn't put those barriers and those limits out there, you know. So, yeah. but I mean, all along that type of stuff, as I did sport and played wheelchair rugby and started swimming... You know, I got faster and stronger, and then you, you know, it helps your your independence in the end as well. You know, so so that's why you know I'm telling you the story, the sport, and the independence and getting independent is completely paralleled and linked for me because they they helped each other. You know, so but yeah, you know, and then obviously cycling. I started cycling, but I had to figure out you know hand cycles were made for paraplegics, so I had to make my own gears. You know, figure out where I put the gears and customize my own bike. Um, you know, and, and cycling has developed a lot, and I had to make special grips so I can pedal, uh, you know, grip on the pedals and stuff. Um, and look, I've refined a lot over the years, but um, I mean, today I, I break and do the gears with my elbows, and I've got special grips on the pedals, and my bike um, weighs around 10 and a half, 11 kilos. I mean, it's incredible technology, mm. you know, but yeah, and then the racing chair, same story, you know, quite pushed differently. There's no quad in South Africa that does these things, so, you know, I had to figure this stuff out for myself. Um, but I did eventually find like guys overseas. I went to a training camp, you know, and all that stuff helped a little bit with the with the racing chairs. So, um, but yeah, you know, so it's, it was a very long, inter interesting journey, you know. But I wouldn't wouldn't change a thing, though, you know. Is the um is uh, uh there more and more challenged athletes competing in your region? Um yes, definitely. Uh, you know, I'm obviously you know me doing it, it. It's good exposure, and it gets a lot of guys to to mm -hmm. race, but. Definitely more paraplegics than quads, um, but I mean, the, yeah, slowly but surely there's more quads like participating like in hand cycling and so on. But I mean, 
doing a triathlon, uh, you know, I think is, is quite a big step to take, even if you like a strong quad with triceps, you know, so not that many guys doing triathlons yet, you know, but definitely hand cycling is growing, especially, you know, on the paraplegic side, that it's definitely growing big time, you know, so. So just, just back to your race in Western Australia, um, mm. how was it for you? Like, was it, uh, I, I'm gathering you're a very driven, very motivated individual, and very competitive. Yeah. Was it? Was it? Was it? Did you treat it as an as a as an achievement or just another stepping stone to to going further? Okay, so look for me, it's very important for people. You know, they they look at your times and they, you're this quadriplegic, and now it's this amazing story. But they don't see you necessarily as a professional athlete. Now, for me, I'm a professional. You know, mm -hmm. so I think also that's why. I mean, it's the first time I did it. I did it with a broken arm. I think the time I did was fast, but I know I can go faster. So, look, for me, it was an incredible experience, and it was like a one of those things that you said, yeah, one day I'll maybe be able to, to do that, you know. Even a year back, I, I would have told you, no, I don't know, eh? I don't know if it's possible, but I'll keep mm -hmm. trying and keep ticking over and do it, you know. But, um, yeah, so so for me, it, you know, I always say when you set the date, um, it becomes a goal. So if you have a dream, once you set a date, it becomes a goal, and you must already have that next dream and goals, you know. So... For me, I'm very goal-driven and, and dream-driven, you know. Um, but yeah, so it, for me, you know, it was a stepping stone. I want to do more. Uh, and I definitely, you know, I've already asked the guys at Kona. Um, you know, I would never thought Kona is possible for me um, because I chose the, the race in Australia because of the flatness of the bike course, you know, because mm -hmm. for me, um, the level of disability that I have, you know, to make the bike cut off is the toughest part, you know. And um, But after this race, you know, I... So once again, once you move the one barrier, then you think the next one's possible. So, you know, I believe maybe Kona is possible now. Um, I don't sweat, so it's much, I mean, it's really hot in Kona normally and that type mm. of things. But at the same time, I approach this race professionally. I train professionally. I've got mm. a brilliant coach, as I said, in Reynolds, um, Tissink. And, um, and, you know, I was going for a time, you know. And, you know, initially when I started this Ironman thing, I thought they were going to have to shift the bike cuddle for me just so that I can finish the race, you know, and then I, I did the half and then I realized, no, geez, I can make the bike cut off. And then I started training and I thought, no, geez, I can do 12 and a half hours, which is incredible if you think I've got 15% of, of my sum. Yeah. And, um, you know, then I broke my arm and, you know, for five minutes I thought, no, yes, I can't believe this, you know, it's six weeks out, it's not going to happen. But then I just started thinking, I read up on all the muscles I have and the muscles you use and I, I broke the forearm, the ulna, you know, badly, but I just realized, geez, maybe I can still do this, you know, I just, because I, I built such a big base at that stage, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, so then I went out and I did 13 hours 24 on the full Ironman, only like 50 minutes off my, my time that I wanted to do, so, I mean, with everything that happened, you know, I, I can't, it's, it's still, you know, I can't really describe how amazing it was for me, you know, but it was incredible, you know, but, um, yeah, you know, so it wasn't just to finish that I wanted to go for a time, you know, and look, breaking my arm, I, the time changed, obviously, but, you know, I smashed what I thought I was going to be able to do on the day, you know, so it was incredible. Mm. Yeah. You know, Pete, you are a very driven and um, determined individual, you know, uh, and um, my, my question is, um, do you think that um, the accident has made you stronger in your mental capacity, in your determination, than you were before the accident. Yo, that's a tough question. Eh? <laughs> um, I think. Look, I was obviously very determined and positive and driven before my accident. You know, so a lot of that, those tools and the mindset I had, I think, really did help me a lot. Um, but I, I do believe. It, yeah, I, I do believe it, it probably just did strengthen me, you know, I, I've learned so much from a whole bunch of different angles in life now after the accident, um, and, and it can only make you stronger, so I definitely believe yes, you know, I definitely did, um, but, you know, saying that, you know, it doesn't mean, yeah, yes, you should go and have an accident and, yeah, it's going to make you stronger, you know, <laughs> you know, but, you know, I believe that things happen as you know, they happen as they, they happen and then, yeah, you, you must just take what you have and, and go with it, you know, so. Do you think this is an opportunity for you to, um, well, you're obviously an inspiration to all athletes, um, but there's an opportunity for you to start to help 
bring other um, less able-bodied athletes into the sport, and um, and with possibly you know a view that why couldn't it just uh, we see some more numbers there? I mean, I know logistically, I, I had I was lucky enough to help out at the ITU race this year with the um, disabled athletes and. The, the, they're incredible athletes, and it was a real pleasure to hang out with them. But the, you know, logistically, there's a lot of stuff you've got to go. I mean, nobody yeah. likes to pack your pack your bike box, but you, I mean, you've got at least two, and then you've also got the challenges mm. of of getting from A to B. Yeah, sure. Look, I definitely see it. It is definitely an opportunity, and I, look, I, I do believe my story. If if not for competitive sport, but just for guys to realize, but geez, I can still do a lot of stuff with my life and fun stuff, you know, that you did maybe before your accident even. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the logistics is an issue and I mean, obviously, paratriathlon will be at, at the Paralympics in 2016, but I mean, at this stage, there's just one category for wheelchairs, you know, so me and a guy who's, who's an amputee with both legs race against each other, so that's, I mean, I'm not going to qualify, yeah. obviously, a guy like that. Mm. But I mean, yes, definitely, I would want to get more numbers out there but whether you know whether it be, is for triathlon specifically or just to get into cycling or wheelchair racing or swimming, you know, whichever way for me, you know, I just love to inspire other guys to go out and do it, you know, and, and not just disability wise, you know, able-bodied guys, you know, um, you know, for me the important thing is that, that people must realize, you know, set a goal out there and um, you, you know if you go from zero to doing a five kilometer that is brilliant. So, mm. you know, it's a goal, and then from there you jump to the next goal and the next goal, you know. So I definitely believe if, if my story can help people believe in that and believe in themselves and help them to go for those type of things, you know, it, it's great. So definitely something that I, I aim to do, you know. You completed um, Ironman Western Australia um, recently, so tell us about um, the experience. Yeah, yeah, it was incredible. The the support, it was in Australia. I'm from South Africa, so, you know, you, you don't expect necessarily that much support or whatever people don't know you, but I must say Ironman and the events company was amazing. They put articles out beforehand, um, a newspaper article as well. I was on the website, and on race day, the support was incredible. There's actually quite a lot of South Africans in Western Australia, um, mm. and I mean the guys either c called me on Super Pit, my nickname, or South Go South Africa, and yeah, yeah, it, it was amazing, you know. And yeah, everything went according to plan, and the weather was great. Um, the pros racing, even you know, was amazing. And on the run, um, by the time I get off the bike, the, there's this the going out on the run. There's quite narrow sections, so. Um, I catch guys on the run, um, and you know, I had a guy cycling in front for safety, telling the guys I'm coming, and the people just jumped out of the way and cheered me on. You know, like mm. I, I nice. you know, if I'm that tired at that point in the race, you know, I'm just like this bloody wheelchair guy, and I have to get out of the way. That's not. The, they all were just amazed and jumping out of the way and go, go, go. You know, so mm. yo, it was it was an amazing, amazing experience. Mm. So at which uh, point of the race, um, typically, do you have to, do you find yourself having to dig deeper than um, you really like to? <laughs> you, you know what I always say, as a professional, I I feel like I, you know, your toughest days out there is, is in training already. I believe, you know, like if you mm -hmm. really prepare yourself well for a race. Um, so I must say, like. On the race day, I sat there that morning looking at the sea um, before I, you know, started moving into the water, and I, I just realised, yes, I'm ready for this race. So, the toughest part was the bike for sure. Um, you know, I had to make that cutoff, and what basically happened is because of my broken arm, I didn't really use my left arm 100%. So. And I mean, when you cycle and train, you don't realize how much you do or don't use it. But um, you know, you go according to pain, etc. But uh, it was a three laps of 60 k's on the bike, and on the last lap, um, uh, my right shoulder started hurting badly. Like you know, I, it was like when I know this is now um, injury type of hurting. So then I started using my left arm more, and I realized, geez, how little I did use it. You know, I don't know, maybe 50 percent or 60 percent, whatever. And then my left forearm started hurting, and I was worried about, is, is it now? 
just the muscles that hasn't been working properly or hard for six weeks or is it the bone or am I doing damage for, on the plate that was on my on my bone or whatever. But I, I just kept believing this, you know, I'm going to do it. So that last lap on the bike definitely was hard. Um, and I did, but at that stage, you know, I'd gone so fast. I can't believe how fast I averaged, you know, for my for my disability level, that is really fast. And But I knew I could drop down to averaging around 20 and I'll still come in at a, a proper time. And I took it a bit easier for the right shoulder and the left arm, you know, just to maintain that. And I was just hoping that once I start pushing in the racing chair, same muscles but different movement, it'll start feeling better. Um, and yeah, luckily, like it was four laps of 10 or, you know, four laps of 10, 11, roughly. Um, and yeah, after the first lap on the on the push um, or on the run, you know, it started feeling better again, you know. So, but that was definitely sort of the tough part in the race for me where I had to like fight my mind, you know, you know, through the pain of the shoulder and my forearm, you know, uh, am I hurting it, am I not, you know, should I finish, should I not? Um, and then what actually happened, there was a paraplegic guy also racing on the day and um, I passed him on the last lap and I think when I passed him, it gave me that little bit of extra motivation to see this <laughs> low level pop is now passing the paraplegic in the race, you know, so, you know, I mean, nothing against the guy, he was brilliant, etc. and he cheered me on when I passed him, but I mean, obviously for me, that was amazing motivation, you know, so that, yeah. yeah, it really helped yeah. me, I think, you know, and gave me that little bit of extra boost to push through the pain, you know, so it was great. What's the difference between your cycle and your run bike? So, so the hand bike, um, both of them have three wheels, uh, but the hand bike, you lie flat down on your back and your, it's sort of the opposite, your, your gears and everything is uh, up, upside down from what a normal bike would be. Mm -hmm. And then you've got um, pedals, but you pedal to, together. So it's not, um, Okay, you know, both hands are together um, in the circle. I put it that right. way. We're yeah. cycling, you know, it's counter up and down, up and down. Uh -huh. And um, then you've got gears, obviously, like a normal bike. I use SRAM and SRAM Red and SRAM XX combination. Um, and I, I obviously have different um, adjustments, so I, I can do the gears and brakes with my elbows. But basically, you lie flat, flat down. And then the racing chair, um, you sit sort of just in a very uncomfortable position. I don't know if people have watched like Boston Marathon, London Marathon, um, the wheelchair races, but but that's the the run part, if I can put it that way. You know, so mm -hmm. you sit in sort of a on on your knees in a hunched position, quite uncomfortable, um, and then you propel your chair with um, push rims, and you've got a much smaller front wheel and then normal 27 inch. Um, mostly, most of us use discs on on where the push rims are. Mm -hmm. So, very. So when, when when you train, um, you 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 also need um, need support, someone to help you, um, yes. with the swim, with the bike, and the run as well. So do you do you um do you have like a buddy that you always um bring with you to your races, or do you have um different ones that you work with? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I've, I've got a guy, normally you know, I must say I have a whole bunch of friends have raced with me in different races throughout my, you know, career as a quadriplegic, I can say, my sporting career. Mm -hmm. um, but I had a good friend, um, Walter Luch, uh, who raced with me on race day, and he was amazing on race day. Um, but I have to say, it's been a real team effort between me and my wife. Uh, my wife has been the person who's been there every training session. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like on, on the weekends when I go to look for me a long bike ride over the weekend, my longest one was an eight and a half hour ride followed by a 30 minute push off the bike. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, then in the heat and everything, as I say, I don't sweat eat as well. Uh, you know, the first four hours, she'll leave me on my own. I've got my food and my everything and um, I'll, like, you know, I'll wet, my, wet my, or soak myself with water, etc. you know, by myself. But then in the second half, she's always there. Um, you know, and support, etc. And sometimes she actually cycles with, and she's got a hand bike as well. Um, so you know, all my training sessions, swimming, cycling, running, she's there. You know, I, I can possibly do the cycling. I can sort of manage on my own if I have to. Um, you know, get in and out and those things. But the swim and the and the racing chair, I need help. Um, you know, getting in and putting my gloves on as uh, with because of the level of what that I am. Um, and yeah, so look, you know, I get all this accolades and achievements and all those things, but it's not only me, it's me and my wife and, you know, mm -hmm. it's a real team effort and her name's Ilza and yeah, you know, it's, 
yeah, you know, I can't say thanks enough. You know, she's an absolute angel, and I don't think I deserve her for that matter. <laughs> so we can rightly call her the Iron Mate. Yeah, yeah, it's actually funny. There was the shirts. Um, they sold shirts there at the Australian Ironman, and uh, like with a chair, and then it says Iron Mate. So she's definitely my Iron Mate for sure. <laughs> So what uh, what have you got planned for the rest of the year and the future? Um, you know what what's the next uh, next uh, challenge to to conquer? Okay, so I mean, racing for my country is always a big honour. I mean, last year I also raced with hand cycling, and um, although with hand cycling I have to race in the class above me once again, so I was just lucky to qualify last year again. Um, and then obviously with marathons and athletics and those things. Um, so, I mean, if depending on what events is available at Rio, I would love to go to Rio again and represent my country. Um, and even this year, UCI World Cup events, if cycling happens, if, if they actually do split the class, um, it'll be great for me. But um, obviously the big one for me now would be Kona. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have, you know, I've, I've sent them, you know, I've emailed them, told them about me, etc. And I'm hoping that, you know, the time I did will qualify me for the paraplegic division for that matter, but I mean, I'm hoping that the uniqueness of my story, um, you know, will, will get me in there and give me my slot, you know, but, uh, you know, I'm waiting to hear on that, so, you know, I can't say it's definitely going to happen, but I would love to do that, you know, so I'm already training as though it's going to happen because I have to start now, you know, so mm -hmm. if it does, then everything I do will go towards that, but I'm also planning on doing the London Marathon, um, and then Padua Marathon in Italy, and then hopefully Oita Marathon in Japan later in the year. Um, and then obviously I've got our national cycling champs coming up next week. I'm doing a bit more mile. It's like a, a really big open water swim here in South Africa. Um, and then, yeah, we'll see what happens with the cycling and selections, hopefully a couple of World Cup events, you know. So definitely planning a full year, but, um, you know, everything will go towards Kona, um, you know, if, if I get that slot, you know. So that'll be great. Um, uh, and is there anybody uh, you want to thank? Have you got any sponsors that ha is there other companies that help you out? Yes, definitely. Um, look, on on my Ironman journey last year, um, Deloitte uh, sponsored my half Ironman and my full Ironman attempt fully. Um, they bought me my new bike, everything. So I, you know, and then the support from my company as a company as a whole. I work here at Deloitte as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just absolutely incredible. Um, so I, you know, I have to give a big thanks and shout out to Deloitte. Um, and then Zone 3 wetsuits, um, they uh, sort of supported me with my wetsuit um, Victory D that I used in the pool Ironman and now for 2014 they fully sponsoring me for the year. Um, so, you know, big thanks goes out to them as well. So, um, and then I, I had some support from Powerball um, and yeah, so just thanks to them as well, you know. And then obviously everybody out there that supported me on Twitter and, you know, the yeah, like Ironman themselves and the events company that just, you know, allowed me to race at Ironman Australia. They were great, you know, so just thanks to all of them as well. It was brilliant. Right, and uh, one, 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 one last question. What's your favorite mantra that you meditate on when the going gets tough? I mean, I'm sure it's, it's, it's tough every time um, when you're out training, mm -hmm. but um, is, there, is there a line of code that um, you always fall back on? Yes, you know, as I say, I'm I'm a Christian, and um, yeah, it's amazing. Like you, you know, you need that thing to if you start wandering off your mind, and you need to get back into that focus. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, I've got this one song, "Our God" from Chris Tomlin, but yeah, you know, there's a there's a line in there that once I start going off drift, then I just get back. You know, I, mm -hmm. I just put that in my mind, and I just go back into it. You know, and I kind of just says, if our God is with us, then you can ever stop us. You know, and I don't know. You know, when I say that, when I hear that, the music that goes yeah. with it, or whatever, that puts me back into yeah. focus. You know, yeah. wow. But you know, you know, like for me, you know, big saying is always just, um, you know, just live it. You know, I say God created my life, so just live it. And um, so for me, just live it means just live it. Whatever you do, whether it be cultural, sport, or, you know, career-wise or whatever, but go out and just live it, you know, live life, you know, and, um, yeah, you know, and then, then I think my, one of my favorite things that I, after my Ironman, you know, like, for me, impossible is just an opinion, and, um, you know, I hashtagged uh, I am possible for, you know, most people see it as impossible, but I see I am possible, impossible, right. as I am man possible, <laughs> so for me, it's I am man possible, so, you know, when I hear the word impossible, that everybody says, I just see Iron Man possible. So it goes a long way for me. 
Wow. You know, Pete, it's actually, um, I'm, I'm, I'm smiling because um, coincidentally, um, I, I thought of that too, you know, um, because, um, so I did my first Ironman um, last year, and after my Ironman, I, went, um, I had another dream. I wanted to cycle across the United States, so I'll be doing that um, this summer, and um, for someone who's totally new to endurance cycling, this would be a big, daunting audacious um, dream for me to pursue and um, a lot of people have asked me like can, can you really do it you know and can you train up to that kind of mileage and so um, so I'm frequently you know um, bombarded with the word impossible and and one mm. day you know just a couple of weeks ago I, I, I was uh, a thought crossed through my mind it's not impossible it is I am possible you know so yeah I, I totally agree with you Yes, no, I mean, that's why it's, it's great, but I mean, that's the thing also for you, that now is a big, big challenge, but you, I mean, it, it's in your mind, you know, like, you just have to get past that in your mind, and then you'll do it, you know, so, right. but good luck with, I mean, thank you. <laughs> I've seen, I don't know, Ram that you want to do, the road race across America, or, yeah. is it just, yeah, because, oh. I, I mean, I've seen that, it's a tough race, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. So I'm not doing the race across America. Um, that's that's um, that's done in between eight to twelve days. It's a race. Um, what mm. I'm doing is more of a bike bike packing, and um, oh, yeah, okay. I'm gonna take yeah, I'm gonna take take more than eight days. It's gonna take between thirty to forty days to complete it. Sure. Okay, yeah. So you're doing a big big trip. Yeah. No, good luck with that. Yeah. Eh? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yep. Sounds awesome. Well, thanks, Peter, for spending the time with us. Um, uh, what I'll be taking out of this is to see how fast I can actually get dressed because I think you've certainly <laughs> set a, a pretty t pretty tough task. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, try and beat it. Try and beat it. <laughs> uh, absolutely. It's been, no, it's, been, it's been wonderful to have you on. And... Um, and, we, and if you are coming over here for the London Marathon, I will, um, I'll definitely drop by and say hi. No, awesome, mate, guys. And thanks so much for the opportunity and inviting me to chat with you guys. It's been great to meet you guys. And, um, yeah, yeah, it's a privilege. Maybe. Thank you, Peter. Awesome, guys. Okay, cool. So that's um, that's good. Thanks, thanks very much. It was a, a tremendous story, and um, I really enjoyed you know spending the time with you. No, thanks, Graham. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't yeah, I don't think I finished asking all the questions that I need to ask, actually. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. Well, you're welcome to ask more if you want to. <laughs> yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get a hold of your um, email. Um, and I've got it. We'll okay, cool. Yeah, so um, Angie will follow up, because we, we like to have a couple of photos, um, and also all your details, so your Twitter handle, and, and, and any way people can interact with you. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, and we'll put all that up on the. They'll be in the show notes on the website, and um, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, if anybody needs to get in contact with you, they will. No, that's perfect, guys. Thanks. Um, and um, yeah, and, and it's really, I'm really, I'm really sort of proud to have you as part of the kind of the triathlon Sherpa podcast family. So um, thanks very much yeah. for the time, and um, uh, and we're always around if we can ever help with anything. Just uh, feel free to let us know, and um, yeah. I will definitely do. Thanks, guys. Um, we'll, I'll be um, looking for a sponsor for my Kona trip, but uh, hopefully I'll come right here on this side of the of the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. Absolutely. Well, um, if yeah, if we can ever do anything to help you along with that, let us know. Um, no, well, and, thanks, guys. Um, appreciate that. Well, um, take care, and we'll uh, we I'm I'm sure we'll stay in touch. Perfect. Yep. Hundred percent. All right. Cool, take care. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.